right, welcome, welcome, everyone. It's Open Source Friday. Welcome. Uh, I know you've been yeah, waiting yeah. all week for this, and uh, uh, we've been pretty consistent in the last couple of weeks. Not only we've had uh, Evan Yu about three weeks ago, we also had Paulus from Home Assistant, and uh, we now have Colby, who's coming on to talk about, actually, I skipped something. Gregor was last week uh, talking about open source maintenance and management of your repos, and then Colby is here. Colby, you want to say hello? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, I'm super excited to have you on because we we go way back <laughs> at least at least till November, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think, or maybe October. I'm not sure when we first met um, online, um, but yeah, you you just recently took a new role um, at Apple Tools. Uh, but rather than me explain what you do and why you're here, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm Colby Fayok. I'm a developer advocate at Apple Tools. So I work closely with the developer community, trying to do things like building integrations and uh, content that really speaks towards like the technical uh, aspects of things and how to get Apple Tools up and running. Um, but generally speaking, like I also focus on building like educational content for things like React, Next.js, and general JavaScript. And I love GitHub Actions, which is you know why I'm here. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on here. But uh, yeah, that's. Me in a nutshell. Yeah, uh, I personally love GitHub Actions as well. Uh, if you know me from the internet, um, I'm BWO. I don't know if I need to uh, explain myself or introduce myself. But um, yeah, I've been working on a lot of action content in the last month. And uh, what I love is that we're going to be talking about your action today. But before we jump in, uh, I just want to mention, everybody, this is live. We are streaming on Twitch, twitch.tv slash GitHub, if you happen to be watching the YouTube video. Um, we cannot allow any URL, so if you drop a URL into the chat, uh, it will get blocked, and you'll get uh, basically auto banned for sixty seconds. So um, <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> Someone was put, put the put my shoe on the head, which I'm actually wearing socks. I have no shoes inside, so it's just it's a family rule. <laughs> but uh, maybe Colby will put his shoe on his head. Um, but also mention we do have a code of conduct, so definitely look down below in the description if you are well. Well, definitely take a look at that if you have not got yourself up to speed with that, um, because we want to make sure everything is nice and friendly and comfortable with everybody who wants to come through. So please be respectful to our guests, be respectful to the people in the chat, and also we will be ask, answering questions the entire time. So if you have a question. Drop it in the chat. I'll try to grab it. Uh, a lot of times the chat actually answers a question before I can get to it. So I'll acknowledge the people who answer the questions as well. Uh, and I will do my best to pronounce your Twitch handle uh, <laughs> to the best of my ability. So uh, no promises that I get it right. Uh, but shout out to uh, I'm Maple Leaf who gave me the shoe on the head idea. Um, maybe if I can grab a newspaper or something, <laughs> maybe that'll be, uh, that'll be easier. Um, but yeah, uh, we are going to be talking about your action, uh, which is Apple Tools Eyes Action. Um, so uh, I'm curious. Do you want to? I guess actually, would it be perf Would it be better if we talked about Apple Tools first and explain that before yeah. we jump into this? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll wait till you bring that up quick. Um. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm struggling. So <laughs> there we go. So. So Apple Tools is an automated visual testing uh, solution. Um, so what we do in like from a really high level point of view, we come in and we take snapshots, screenshots of your application, and we create a baseline where then future test runs will compare those previous screenshots. Um, but it's we've gone from pixel by pixel, which is pretty common in the industry, to what we see as a more superior solution where we actually use AI to kind of intelligently look at those different screenshots. So we can compare not just is a tiny pixel different, but is there something actually important? So that includes things like content regions where, you know, if you're just writing a new blog post, maybe you don't want that to flag uh, the test results. But if it's actually something important, like the layout and the navigation, like then you can actually see the result flag. Align to click okay, align excellent. And is this, and is this uh, look at results cross browsers? Because I know sometimes my browsers can have different layouts because of maybe Firefox and their how they do CSS. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a solution we have called UltraFast Test Grid, which it's pretty easy to add a bunch of different browsers into your configuration that'll stack up and run through all these different browsers and even like native and mobile apps. So you can cover, you know, not just browsers, but a ton of different use cases to make sure that your product is fully covered. Okay, excellent. Yeah, it looks like 
We were actually uh, playing the uh, Apple Tools uh, audio in the background for everybody <laughs> while you were talking. So hopefully the uh, everybody got exactly what Apple Tools was all about. Uh, we can we can move on for that. If not, there's a great video that I, I, I'm more than happy to drop in the chat too as well. So I'll drop that. Uh, but do you want to explain? Um, well, while you're here, do you want to explain the Apple Tools eyes action? So. Um, most people actually in the chat, just let us know if you're familiar with GitHub Actions. We can go back and talk about that. But for now, why don't we talk about uh, Apple Tools Eyes Action? Yeah, sure. So I'll first start off like we have a ton of different SDKs that integrate directly into like pre existing workflows. So if I'm using Cypress or Selenium or even Storybook, like we have an SDK that can easily fit into that and, you know, mostly just work once you configure that. But I also wanted to play around with the idea of what if we can come up with something like a GitHub action where if we just drop that right into your workflow file, it'll, you know, quote, just work and it'll go out and, you know, scrape your, or not scrape your content, but take snapshots of your website and your application and be able to give you that coverage without really putting in a lot of hard work. Cause you know, some people might not have a testing solution or maybe they don't want to pile another library on top of that. So this is, this is another way to do that. Um, the way that I'm kind of approaching that is uh, this kind of first iteration that I put together is what it'll do is it'll take that base URL that you can see in the snippet there, and it'll actually crawl your site. So there's a NPM package called, I think it's like sitemap generator, where it'll go through in Node, it'll crawl your website. Yeah, I think it's sitemap generator. Uh, but it'll cr crawl your website, it'll create that sitemap file, uh, okay. which is a pretty common format and then inside of the action i use cypress to spin up the to spin up a browser and run through each of those urls and take a snapshot with apple tools um, so the snapshots are really simple i plan to add more configurations because there's a lot you can do with apple tools rather than just you know like i was saying before ai and uh, ai powered and um as opposed to just simple pixel by pixel snapshots but you know i'm going to keep adding on to this and be able to build new features um another thing you can pass in your own sitemap file. So say you don't want it to just crawl every single web, uh, page on your website, you can pass in your own uh, sitemap to XML file, or even one of the other plans I have, you know, given that I'm big in the Jamstack space, I want to be able to take a static directory. So say somebody can come in here and instead of providing a base URL or a sitemap URL, they can provide a static directory where we can see that we can scrape all the HTML files in there, and then we can spin up a local server and run through that. So it's just giving more options for somebody to be able to drop this in into any workflow as an action and get up and running with visual testing. Yeah, I love this. And um, I want to shout myself out one more time, but uh, <laughs> I spent the last month in February doing 28 days of GitHub Actions because uh, I happen to be doing tons of GitHub Action work. And um, the one thing I love about what you just explained, but you went way more detailed than I even have gotten to. <laughs> so like, if you look at my post, you won't get that much detail. Uh, so def definitely, thanks for everybody for showing up and getting that sort of experience. Um, that was a deep high level overview, right? <laughs> deep high level overview, exactly. Also, I got some dependencies I need to update. Um, but I, I bring this up because I've got this action that I use, um, and I, I'll get to a point real quick. And what's up, Marco? Welcome in the uh, chat. Um, I've got this Lighthouse action, and it actually looks at the Netlify deploy preview uh, directly, because mm -hmm. Netlify, you get a predicted uh, deploy preview URL, which uh, appends the, um, the the branch name and the name of the site. So you can predict that. So what this action does, it actually does a Lighthouse CI check um, directly in the, the PR and within their action runner. And I love that so much. And I wanted to do that similarly for like my Vercel deployments as well as my GitHub pages. But well, GitHub pages will work because it's predictive URL, but I haven't built that yet. But when you talk about the sitemap generator and using Cypress to kind of build that it, the experience, not the experience, what I'm talking about, the environment, um, mm -hmm. now that it's clicking in my head of like, if I wanted to rebuild that experience that's not just Netlify specific, I could build that for any sort of experience using things like Cypress as well. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I probably want to look at your Lighthouse thing and borrow ideas from there and yeah. you know, back and forth. Because like ultimately, I want to, I want it to be able to have it so you can configure it, you know, however you want, but you don't have to go out of your way to do those type, those types of things. So, um, you know, again, just so it just works when you drop it in with whatever your project solution is. Yeah, yeah. And um, speaking of just works, I know we're we're kind of racing through the uh, the conversation, but I kind of want to see it just work. Um, so, 
you had mentioned before we started that you had a, a quick demo to be able to show. Yeah, sure. Um, did you want to? Uh, so if you go to my GitHub, and I think if you literally just inside of the URL put the word test in front of, or yeah, that works. <laughs> I was going to say test in front of the uh, repo name. So oh, gotcha. Test app, so test Apple Tools Eyes Actions. Uh, yeah. That's great naming convention. <laughs> it was unintentional, but it works pretty well. <laughs> it's um, not forgettable at this point. Yeah. So I think we can, first of all, pull up the workflows file. Yeah. And we can see. So here I have, I think I have, th yeah, three different examples. The first one. Um, so what this is going to do every time a new, uh, every time somebody pushes a commit up to main or a new pull request, uh, targeting main, it's going to fire this action. And what it's going to do is it's going to, in this first one, it's simply going to take the top level URL and run a screenshot on that. And the reason by default, it only does the top level one is as you can imagine, if you're crawling a site that can get really big. So I want to try to control that so that if somebody's just trying it out, they don't, you know, unintentionally DDoS themselves or something. Where does the, um, where's the specifically grab the top level? Is it this right here? The base URL, yeah. So gotcha. it'll just, if, if it doesn't have a defined depth, it's going to just simply use that and then use that for the visual testing. Um, but then as you see in the second example, I have a max depth defined. And so what that'll do is it'll find any link on that top level page, and it'll also provide visual testing on each of those links. Um, I think it might be domain specific. I can't remember, uh, I would imagine so, but um, that way it's only going one level deep. So it's still gonna grab a lot of uh, value off of that sitemap, but it's not still gonna be super deep, um, but that's configurable. You can really set it up to do whatever you want. Um, it's just, of course, that's gonna scale the more you have more pages to your site. Uh, yeah. But then finally at the end there, I just have another simple example where you're providing your own sitemap file. Um, you know, sitemap files are really common. So like people specifically maintain those to whatever their preference is. So maybe you just want to pass that in and only have those uh, pages checked out. Um, but either way, whatever the option is, it'll grab that and it'll run the test. Now, I'm curious if you're actually able to see the logs on your end, um, if you wanted to try going up to the actions tab. So like you can see all the workflow runs. Yeah, I should be able to see the logs yep yep cool are you able to click into i think uh it should be this one yeah cool so what it's doing here you can see it's spinning up cypress and that's where it's starting to run the visual test so in this example here we see some gr uh, green check mark and then a few red flags what that's saying is when it visited that page and provided a visual snapshot it found a difference in that page and it's flagging it so that we know that we can look inside the apple tools dashboard and figure out what that change was um oh nice yeah am i able to click this or i need to have access to your um Oh, you're so that's Netlify app. So that's probably one of the reasons why this one fails because it was a 404. Um, <laughs> I okay. think I haven't ran it on this specific one in a while, and I just ran it this morning just to get a um, get you some, know something that we can yeah. show off. But it's it's a good use case because you know yeah. it failed, and it's something but, that would flag in Apple Tools. Yeah, and it's a good thing. It's a good use case to find. Like if sometimes we name things. Actually, I'm going through. Oh, I just hit my mic, but apologies for that. Uh, I'm going through some updates in the GitHub Hackathon site right now. And that's a thing I've mentioned before on the stream and on the internet. But um, like we're changing the names of different files and different pages. And at the moment, it's a Gritsum app. So it uses static site generations to develop those things. Uh, but very easily, we we're na renaming things and finding that like things are broken. Um, mm -hmm. so like if you happen to make a lot of changes or you take a lot of contributions, uh, from the team, uh, it's nice to be able to get another check to see where, where things sort of fall over and break. And it's funny, it, that was totally like, again, it was another unintentional benefit. Like, cause of course, like being able to provide visual testing gives that capability, but I never connected yeah. it as to also broken pages. Cause that's, you know, that's realistically, uh, going to be an issue for projects. Yeah, I've, um, unfortunately, it's an issue for a lot of my projects. <laughs> <laughs> but so this example was the one where it was actually passing in the HTML file. Now, I don't know if you want to uh, click the depth job on the left. I don't know if that actually will show logs for the site crawling, because that might be interesting. Um, no, so it looks like it didn't. But um, so in this example, though, this is where I actually crawled the website, if you remember, with that. Uh, 
parameter of uh, two levels deep. Um, so if you scroll up just slightly there to the uh, to the page logs, those are that's visual yeah. checking all of those different pages that were a link on that top level page. So it's it's automated. I don't have to worry about maintaining it. Anytime I add a, a page to that site, it's automatically going to get grouped into that um, the testing. Uh, complete side note: Why Space Jelly? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's just uh, one of my websites that I maintain. I, I put like s some tutorials on there and uh, uh, Space Jelly, you know, this is completely non-related to any of this stuff. But yeah, um, so uh, I, I've always thought jellyfish are cool and I really like space. And I gave my friend that idea for to like commission a, a logo kind of thing. And that's what he came up with. And I fell in love with it. Um, shout out to Trevor Lang if you're watching, but oh. um, I love it. Nice. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I love uh, applying um, a nice, cute character to the stuff that you're working on, um, <laughs> yeah. which, like, for the most part, like, you could be as boring as me and have. Now I'm just, like, basically flexing my all my stuff. <laughs> but you can have, like, a, just a straight up. Here's a website and here's some code. <laughs> or you could do space jelly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was pretty cute. And, uh, you know, I I think it really I don't know. I just thought it was fun, and I wanted something fun to put out there. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Sorry. And as you can uh, see, I like purple. Tangent. I told him purple. Yeah, but actually, speaking on that note, you not only um, so yeah, we'll go we'll back to big back to the Apple tools real quick. But I wanted to actually just bring up the point that you actually have a lot of content uh, uh, around GitHub Actions. So like, you got this together pretty quick because you've only been <laughs> at Apple Tools what less than six months um which yeah, is like yeah. yeah very impressive that we have this github action that we can actually drop like basically drop in um uh, apple tools into our sites which i do want to do in the future um but can we talk about some other your, your other github action content and sort of your experience with github actions as a whole sure absolutely um yeah so like i have my content specifically but i can also talk again about another apple tools use case and not just to pull it over there because i think it's interesting yeah um so getting to the content in a second but another use case that we're using it for with apple tools which i find really uh interesting is um as you might like be aware like when you're helping build developer integrations and stuff you want to ultimately provide like examples for those integrations and so for instance with apple tools we have different tutorials where we ha show off how you do it with cypress selenium etc cetera, etc cetera. and i as i kind of inherited maintaining that like i realized that kind of keeping up with all those changes and you know as the sdk changes as other libraries like those things tend to break right so how can i come up with a way where it's automatically checking every time every time dependent by bugs me how can i make sure that it's still working um, so i was able to use github actions where now anytime there's a pull request anytime there's a security pull request uh, it's going to run through those tests and make sure that the sdk is still working properly and further on that we're also going to come up with uh, another use case where we're going to I think we're going to run like a daily cron where we're going to try to upgrade the packages. So um, that way we can always pull in the latest version of the SDK and making yeah. sure that it's still working with the examples. And again, it's just this is providing like a maintenance layer that I don't have to worry about when we're trying to make sure that these examples are always working. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious of how you are using actions to pull in packages to maintain those uh, SDKs. So I have uh we haven't done the upgrade portion yet, but um, what my plan is, is since you can run really any command line scripts, my idea is that um, I'll run npm install uh, at latest for the SDK package. And then uh, since there's also that, I'm sure you're aware of the package to check the code back in with the uh, GitHub, uh, by passing in the GitHub token, like that would be the idea. So we would upgrade that package. And once it gets checked in, I would think that that would kick off another example run and make sure, make sure that that works. Yeah, yeah, it's um, there's it's a conversation I've actually had a couple times with um, uh, Gregor, Gregor, who's actually who was just on the stream last week. Um, so that's why I asked about using an action, because uh, a lot of okay. people aren't are familiar with the this term uh, GitHub apps, um, where if I pull up Probot, uh, Gregor actually maintains this tool called Probot. And the hmm. difference between GitHub Actions and the reason why GitHub Actions uh, is, is so nice because it gives all the bells and whistles for free, there's no installation. Uh, but with Probot, you're, you might get uh, some limitations uh, with GitHub Actions and the sort of what you can do, especially at forks and, and um, third-party mm. uh, users. 
uh, with GitHub apps, it actually gives, it, once you install the, the GitHub app, it actually gives the um, uh, permissions to be able to do things like maintain uh, files, even maintain <laughs> actions. So it'd be something to, to look into. Uh, I mentioned it because yeah. if anybody's not familiar, we do have a playlist of all our previous uh, Open Source Friday guests. And I'm, I'm struggling to find Gregor's, specifically Gregor's um, chat well, we actually did talk about this because uh, what he does is he maintains 25 different repos, uh, and those 25 different repos are all automated and maintained through um, mm. <laughs> through a GitHub app and some GitHub actions as well. So that sounds. Uh, so I I've used I think it's called Depfu before. Have you heard of that one? It sounds no. like it's comfortable. So every so it's like dependent bot but more configure configurable so i can set it to like um try to keep up to date uh, i think with the fu uh so yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> oh and now i just i'm spelling some weird de i could double check the spelling <laughs> but i think that's it yeah there Got we go it. um so like not only will it do security updates uh kind of like dependent bot but this will also like you can set it to every so often it'll create a pull request with a, mi a minor update right that way yes. you're kind of keeping up-to-date dependencies so it's really nice yeah um, i'm guessing it sounds like the probot's similar to that no probot's actually if you no. wanted to build this um so okay. if you wanted to build your so similar to github act actions you can build you have all the pieces to build your own integrations interactions with your sdks GitHub uh, Probot actually is the sort of sort of base layer or the template to be able to build Depfu or Dependabot. Interesting. Dep Dependabot was okay. actually built on Probot. Um, oh. So that's sort of the... Wow. Um, actually, Dependabot wasn't built on Probot. It was built in Ruby. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea, the same approach that they took is similar to like Probot, Interesting. which basically gives you all the bells and whistles up front. So these are some examples. That's really cool. Um, but no, I was just thinking of... Um, of uh, the sort of maintenance too as well, because I've been working with uh, Gregor on this other thing called OctoHerd, and OctoHerd is the the ability to have your scripts. So if you wanted to run through, so outside of just dependency management, imagine you have a template repo, um, and you want to basically, when you update the template, you want to update all the other repos after the fact that were based off that template. Um, oh, also, recently people changed their branch uh, default names, uh, imagine going through all yeah. your repos, updating the branch names to whatever your default branch protection rules. It's more of like, this is actually more focused on like your settings tab and what how you mm -hmm. manage your repos in the settings or in your .github folder. So That's it's, neat, um, yeah, it's, it's really neat. He was on last week to talk about this. So he he's like next level when it comes to managing multiple repos because he kind of ma maintains projects on his own. Um, yeah. But uh, let me drop in some links in the chat and then we can go back to um talking about apple tools because uh actually we didn't go we didn't get into the content either as well yeah. which i i realize <laughs> uh but do you want to quickly talk about the sort of your your egghead courses and the other content you've been sort of sharing around github actions yeah sure so just generally speaking uh when i first kind of learned about actions like it took a, a second for me to kind of make it click like that it's like a ci cd kind of tool that you can really simply use but like once it did click like i feel like it just opened up a lot of doors for things that you can do right inside of your github project rather than leaning on like a bunch of third-party services kind of coming in there which you know there's a lot of great third-party services but i i love that i can just have this workflow file in there um but it also so with my egghead core, I think I have where it walks you through creating a custom GitHub action. Um, but then on some of like my YouTube channel content and the, uh, um, yeah, we can see that first. Uh, yeah, right there. So the automate um, JavaScript and GitHub actions. So that'll actually walk you through um, how to create a node script and kind of like what I did with my uh, GitHub action for Apple tools. And it'll actually walk you through how you can create one because it's really not as bad as it might seem from the outside because there's a few configuration files but ultimately you're running a node scripts and once you have that node script you can really do whatever you want so yeah. it's it's really powerful yeah yeah that's um so are you using a template to the builders are you using the uh the github action toolkit to like what's the uh, what's the trick when you start going through some of this uh content so I'm not familiar with the template part of it, but I do use the uh, the GitHub Action Toolkit um, for some of like the things like grabbing input values and um, I, I don't, I'm not doing anything crazy yet with it, but uh, yeah. you know some of the more basic features that you need. Okay, and to be clear, this is the uh, the repo that you sourced your interactions with for the runners. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so like uh, setting 
grabbing inputs, setting outputs. Uh, I still haven't found, I still haven't put up a lot of use cases for outputs yet, but um, there's a lot of great things that you can do easy. I think I also set up OctoKit itself in one of, I think I did that in a tutorial or something, but um, that was nice where I was able to, uh, I don't think I did it here, but using OctoKit to actually interact with the pull requests and such, um, that was pretty helpful. But um, okay, no, actually that cool. was that was the latest uh, tutorial on spacejelly.dev actually. I, I walk you through there also creating a new uh, GitHub action. Oh, gotcha. all over the place. Yeah. Hey, yeah. So no, this no one, worries. like you'll actually spin up OctoKit. Oh, very nice. Yeah. I think probably my the most fun uh, action that I've done so far, it, it's a pretty simple one, but I created this uh, action template called Content Reminder. Where, So what I'm doing is I'm writing it on a cron where I I have a file that where I source all my different RSS feeds and even just like static files where um, daily this will go out and it'll just like fetch a random piece of content and send me an email with Twilio because I'm notoriously horrible for tweeting my own content. And like I have a huge backlog of content, right? So like having that reminder in my inbox is a great way for me to grab that link and then go out and tweet it or something. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually pretty genius too as well. And uh, I didn't know you had this backlog of content because I don't think I've actually explored Space Jelly. Uh, no pun intended. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I knew about the Egghead course. But yeah, you've got some some good stuff there, and uh, I definitely encourage. I dropped the links as you were talking to as well. Uh, folks, should definitely check out uh, that content if you want to get level up on on GitHub Actions. Um, the one thing we didn't do though is I wanted to actually see what does it look on on your end for the Apple Tools dashboard because you had mentioned uh, when there's a difference. So I don't know if you have yeah. that. Uh, I know I gave sure, you the share link, um, but I'd love to see what it looks like, especially at that four four. Like what 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 I would expect if I logged into the dashboard and saw that. Yep, yeah, sure. Um, just pull it up. Okay, so you can show whenever you want. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then, folks, if you have any questions like about GitHub Actions, uh, about Apple Tools, this now is the time. Definitely let us know. And uh, we're happy to sort of uh, field those and hopefully get you an answer. So like this one particularly, so this is the Apple Tools Eyes dashboard. And this is really, when you first get into the dashboard, this is going to show you all your latest uh, test runs. So what that means is uh, when Brian was running the action, or when we were looking at the logs, like that was one test run where it went out and uh, viewed the different the differences for the site. So in particular here, like you can see the Space Jelly ones where it went out and it took a snapshot of the website. And you know here there was no, so it looks like that was the first baseline image, but there was no differences. So it you know, it's green and it's passing because there's no issues there. Um, I think the browser is too wide for me here. Um, <sighs> let me refresh the page. Well, let's go oh, to so the... You have, uh, you have an amazing amount of tabs too as well. I know, I know. <laughs> I need to exit out of here. Um, but... So I think I just accidentally failed that one myself, but <laughs> besides that point. Um, so like if we go to another one where it's actually failing, like we can see here now, one thing I want to kind of caveat this with is this is not using like any of the cool AI tools or like uh, content regions and stuff. But as you can see here, like where it's showing that difference, let me see if I can zoom in. Yeah. So like it's showing that difference where I, I never re-ran the, these tests and approved it after I um, made some adjustments to the footer. Like here I added more links to uh, the bottom of each blog post and like changed up how the footer looks. So it's flagging that so that I know that it's it's broken, right? Um, now in this event, in this case, I actually intended it to be that way. So it's, you know, I would approve this and I by just like hitting this thumbs up here. Um, but like, if that wasn't the case, I now have that example where I can say, no, that's not good. Uh, that'll go back to, uh, you know, then the developer or whoever can go back and fix it or, you know, figure out what we need to do to resolve it. Um, let me see if I have any other examples. Uh, yeah, I'll just confirm. Um, yeah, so like another one is like we have storybook integration, which is like super easy. Like you just literally need to run um, a single script and it'll go through and capture all of your different components. But here, um, like this is going through and capturing all the different components of a storybook. And that's all automated. Like you literally don't have to set up anything for a storybook integration. Um, what I wanted to also show, which I don't know if I have a test run, ultra fast batch. Okay. So like in this example, you can see the OS here, like where you, one of the questions earlier was, can you do different browsers, right? Yeah. So here in this example, like we're doing, uh, here we're doing Linux and Chrome on, Chrome on Linux or, 
or it looks like this was out of Pixel 2. And then we have an iPhone <laughs> X. And, you know, we're doing all these different uh, devices, which, you know, this is this makes it so much easier to do cross router testing so that you can have those snapshots and understand where things are actually failing. Um, you know, in this instance, again, like there wasn't any issues, but if it found something, it's going to flag that for us. And we know that we're, you know, good to go. Um, which, you know, it's not going to provide that level of detail for you if you're just doing simple, like, um, like imagine if you're just doing like you're testing that a particular element is there like you may, might be missing the entire context that element might be completely off the page you don't know that but because this is actually what the user sees it's going to actually be able to compare that really well yeah yeah and i like the fact that the the different devices are available for you for testing uh i used to have a pixel uh before i lost it in brazil uh long story oh, um, no. <laughs> but i specifically used it so i could do some pwa testing and stuff like that and uh yeah, I, I don't want to carry two phones ever again because it's it's hard to keep yeah. track of, especially the one that you don't really use. Uh, you only use for programming. Um, right. But yeah, that's that's really cool to see, and I like the the fact that you can do that. Yeah, and the thing that that's great is so coupling it with tools like Cypress or tools like uh, you know anything where you can interact with those pages on the browser. So um, in this instance, in this particular test case, like uh, what we're doing is inside of Cypress, we're clicking on the login button. Now this is just a you know a simple static page that we have as the demo, but we're clicking on this so that it goes to this next page. So we're actually testing those interactions, not just one to one things. We're actually testing did that login request work. Uh, now. Imagine that with like end-to-end -end workflows where you want to capture that entire process and it'll capture all those different browsers for that. Excellent. Yeah. Appreciate you yeah. uh, giving us, uh, I guess, eyes on the uh, the Apple Tools uh, <laughs> dashboard too as well. There we go. But can you clarify Apple Tools eyes actually, is it, it's a product within Apple Tools? Yeah. So like the I, we have the eyes SDK, eyes is the product, and then the ultra fast test grid is like, on top of that, where it's going to actually go through and um, provide a lot of the additional capabilities on top okay. of it. Excellent. And uh, there's some questions coming in too as well. I've, I want to actually propose this question to you, which uh, this is Ram. I think I got that right. I think I'm going to, if not, that's what your name should be. Uh, where would you say that uh, GitHub Action shine? Like where, do you, where would you, from all the content you've done, like where do you think it really shines within your developer workflow? Yeah, so I think for me personally, the thing that like the the everyday task that everybody can get behind is simply running tests for your project. So like it's so easy to auto automate your tests. Like if you already have a test suite going, like you don't have to have that where somebody's going to have to manually run it every time or do a commit hook where that could be really slow for the developer experience, right? So the way you're setting this up is like every time it gets pushed out to GitHub, it's going to run those tests for you. I think that's like the the most core example of like how this immediately becomes helpful for people. But you know, couple of, like taking off from there, like there like I have that content reminder thing where because I can run it in cron mode, I'm just daily doing a task that I want. So it's really any kind of code task that you want to perform um, in some kind of automated way, like it's a a great tool for doing that. Yeah, I, I, I've given a couple talks on this too as well, just recently in Florida. Florida JS, the meetup, um, they reached out to me and I spoke in Florida. Uh, but they, uh, my examples always go into like GitHub built a tool so you could basically build some new features onto GitHub. Uh, so like updating changes or visual testing and stuff like that, st probably stuff that GitHub is not going to really address within your repository, your yeah, within the framework of what you're looking for. Uh, but what I love about it, like, I like to automate stuff within the repository. So like, if I know mm. that every single time a PR is opened or every time a PR, rather, every time a PR is merged, I know I'm, I'm going to need a change log. Uh, being able to do something like I have a webhook that follows whenever something's merged in the main branch and then generate that change log autom automatically for me. Because that's one thing you, you you don't know when to uh, I, you don't keep up with sort of tweeting out your own content. I don't keep up with keeping proper documentation. So if I have opportunity to automate <laughs> a piece of that, uh, I will do that. And uh, yeah, definitely check out my content. I've got lots of examples on that. Like going back to the open source example, like when somebody does create a pull request, you have no idea. Sometimes you have no idea where that pull re request is coming from or what, the, what it's doing. So like having that GitHub action set up on your account, like when somebody creates a pull request, it'll automatically run those tests. Like you can even run like linting and prettier if you want to format those changes. Like that way it's whenever you have to put your eyes on it, you're not wasting your time testing if it works first. You're just making sure that, you know, the code actually works with those tests. 
Yeah, and uh, I do have an example too that um, <laughs> I'm going to mention it to you because you're doing a good job with uh, making content. So if you want to take this <laughs> and you. run with it, um, I've got an example where I have. Uh, so this is a workshop I, I run, and I'll be running this at All Things. Or sorry, Open Source 101 at March nice. 30th this week, or sorry, this month. And uh, I have an example where we have linting that that happens. So we sort of walk through this. Oop. Yeah, so here we go. We got the node code formatter. It's a whole other GitHub action that we're just going to introduce right now in the middle of the conversation. Uh, but what it does <laughs> is it lints your code for you just as you do it in Prettier. Uh, but imagine someone that hasn't had Prettier set up or you're dealing with contractors and their environments are completely different. Uh, it actually takes that and then it actually commits it back up upstream to your your PR. Interesting. Uh, so you will get a change from the formatted from the uh, uh, the GitHub action to let you know, hey, they formatted your code for you. So, like one thing that I, I I hate doing is like sitting in the conversations and trying to discuss linting when we should be yes. discussing the actual code itself. Like, does the code yes. work? Is the code arc like is it architectured in a way that we think it would survive code smells and all this other stuff? But yet we we get really focused on like double quotes or single quotes in JavaScript, and I think it's valid. Like you should make that decision, but you should make the decision once. Uh, so when he exactly. asks like where GitHub Actions shine, it shines in those areas where you just do out of the box things that you're not able to do. You know, I can't convince everybody to use VS Code. I can't convince everybody to use this thing. Um, I guess you can if you get a JetBrains license. Everybody <laughs> uses JetBrains, and we're we're off to the races. But yeah, unfortunately, not everybody wants to code the same way. Um, I'm trying to convince yeah. everybody to move to Vim, and it's just not working. <laughs> yeah, one way I like to put that is like you, you're making the robots being the bad guy, right? Yes. So like you don't have to have the tension in those conversations of a code review where you have to nitpick on those little things because they are important, like you said. But you know, we don't need that in a code review. Like we just need to look at the major functionality. So it helps so much with that. Yeah. Uh I wanted to take a step back and look at the go back to the action we originally started the conversation with. Um, because we didn't really get into we mentioned the toolkit um to be able to interact with the actions. But uh I wonder if you're able to get, provide some insight into well, one, I'll get to the the proper repo. Um, but some insight into how this was actually built. Sure. Um so I think we can dig in right inside do you want to start from the top? So yeah. Uh, so I'll preface this with the reason. So if you want to go into the Docker file first, um, yeah. like this is the entry point in the application. And you know, I'm I'm not a Docker guy. I don't know what I'm doing really. But the reason why I went with the Docker approach is because I was having a hard time figuring out how to get the Cypress environment up and running properly with all the things that are needed and like the caching mechanisms. And you know, I talked to Gleb over at Cypress and he mentioned maybe Cypress can um, cr uh, create a, a function that they export to install Cypress right in Node, which would be great. Um, I haven't gotten that far yet, but this provides me a way to spin up an environment where I know that I can run my action uh, code and it's going to work. So really what this does, it points to the sh file, which if you want to go to the sh file. Yeah, the entry point, which, oh, is it in source? No, no, no. It's, it was there. It was, yeah, under the Cypress file. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. So <laughs> I don't know why. Again, I was not like this that. is. <laughs> so like again, this is a simple one. Like we go into the workspace directory. Um, here, I'm actually cloning the Apple Tools Eyes action. Um, the reason I'm doing that is because when we're working in somebody else's workspace, and then we create the environment on top of that, I want to be able to pull on that action code that I can use to run it. Now. I maybe that's not the best way to do it. There, I'm sure there's a better way to do it. But again, this is how I figured out yeah. how to do it. Uh, but then we install the dependencies for that. And then we finally run the script. Um, and that's where the meat of it's going to be if we want to head over there. Yeah. And the, the actual JavaScript file itself. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, so so here, yeah. this is where we start to pull out the actions core. And really, I'm only using the core for this one because um, since it's not and like super complex right now, what I'm really only using it for is getting the input values. So yeah. we can even see right at the bottom of the screen there that um, I'm grabbing the API key. I'm grabbing the different configuration variables so that people can set their base URL. Um, but really just so that people can configure it from the outside when they all they want to do is drop it in their workflow file. Um, so. A lot of the top, probably most of the script is actually just grabbing the input values because then um, as we get towards the bottom or the middle rather, this is where I actually do the 
the sitemap uh, generation. So um, once we have that base URL and we kind of determine what kind of depth you want to do, we'll run that sitemap generator function, which will generate that file. Or if you already have your file per provided, I'm going to get that sitemap so that we can use it. But either way, at the end of the day, you're ul we're ultimately going to have um, a pages to check variable, which is going to have an array of all the pages that we want to go through. OK. So as we get down to the bottom here, um, so this is where we actually run uh, Cypress in a scripted way. So they have this uh, method run, which allows us to pass in the configuration that we have. Um, a lot of this is boilerplate. And I actually kind of got the idea of and learning how to do this by uh, Jason Langsdorf actually put together a visual testing plugin for Netlify, which was really cool. Oh, nice. Um, but he did something similar here where you pass in the configuration um, and then you kind of pass in these environment variables because because it's it's a uh, you know we can't set our own arguments to a function that, that don't exist like we create these environment variables so that we can later access them in the cypress environment and that includes the things like the app name which is really just like a title the batch name it's another label um, and then we get some more uh, Apple tools specific configurations. Okay. Um, again, I want to add more things to it, but that's at the core level of what's going on with that. Um, yeah. That's, so I think the uh, for the sake of getting this working and having an example, like this is this is great, and I'm, I'm sure I could see where you could sort of pull the levers and add the new, the new functions and um, expose more of the Apple tools API. But yeah, this is. Um, yeah. For, for me, who has built actions, this is readable and writes JavaScript. Uh, I hope that folks, uh, if you do have questions, um, this is open sourced. So yeah. I highly recommend yeah. you know, drop it a star, give it a fork, open an issue. Appreciate that. Um, and then then we're able to uh, you know continue letting open source win. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I do want to show you one more thing because yeah. uh, I want to show the actual Cypress test. So if you go back up to the top level and you go to the Cypress directory, yep, and then integration, and then the eyes. So the cool thing about this is this is a really short and sweet file. So literally all we're doing is we're taking those pages to check the array and we're looping through it and we oh, okay. open up eyes on each of those URLs and we pass we. So we open the eyes, kind of like you know, imagine a camera lens or your your eye. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, we check the window, grab the page, and then we close the eyes. And that's all you do. Like if you even want to integrate this into your own Cypress workflow, like that's all you have to do to get up and running. So it's it's really nice and short and sweet and just passing in the configuration into Apple tools. Uh, that's awesome because like I don't have uh, – I know oh, Daryl just uh, dropped in the chat. I really need to learn Cypress. I feel like – Gleb was actually on the stream back in December, so I learned Cypress when Gleb came on the stream. Okay. Um, actually added it to my BW Live site, and uh, nice. that's as far as I got. I wrote two tests and basically have not gone back to writing more tests. Um, I just need more code just in general on that site. <laughs> um, yeah. But definitely need more tests. But I like that I can basically have not only Cypress, but also I can also add Apple tools to my, my site and get some of that visual testing as well. Yep, yep. There's not there's not a whole lot that you have to add to get it. And again, this is just the base level. Like we talked about before about like the different browsers that you can test. And of course I want to eventually be able to have that configurable, but like this gets you so much with just this little snippet. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to grab the uh, the link. Folks are asking about my workshop that I mentioned in passing. Um, I will drop it in <laughs> I'll drop it in the chat so that way y'all can catch it. Uh, I won't actually find the that actual awesome. workshop, but essentially, I, I, what I just showed Colby, I walked through that uh, with the. I think we had two hundred people last time we did it last year, um, which was oh, a lot wow. of fun. Uh, if y'all, if you just want to learn about open source, I highly recommend checking out this event. It's free for everybody who wants to register, uh, and you get a lot of sort of aspects. Um, I went to last year. I went to an open source design um, talk or workshop where I learned about design um, in open source and how to sort of That's accomplish really cool. that, which is, yeah, some good stuff. But yeah, I love the theme of that page. Yeah, yeah, they, they do a good job. Actually, Todd uh, had, uh, Todd and the, the Red Hat folks have been in partnership with this, and they do a good job of sort of, this, you know, encouraging people to do open source. I love that there's an event that is actually just focused on 100% that. Um, and it's all beginner focused too as well, to also point that out. That's awesome. Excellent. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's pretty, pretty like, approachable. Uh, the one thing I do want to ask about the, the Docker file, I'm not even ask, 
<laughs> mainly just mention because uh, not a lot of people are aware of this because uh, I know you'd mentioned I'm not a big Docker person. Uh, I literally learned Docker. Uh, well, I knew Docker before, but I started using Docker more heavily because of GitHub Actions. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I started off this conversation with a um, with my <laughs> links to there we go. Build your own GitHub Action without a Docker file. Um, not a lot of people are aware of this, but we have this feature called composite run steps. Uh, and this actually allows you to put all that sort of bash scripting directly in an action.yaml file, which we didn't actually take a look at. Uh, so I do encourage you, Colby, if you if you yeah. want to back out of the, the sort of Docker rabbit hole, um, you can definitely check that out. Um, but as I could actually even show an example too as well. But I did want to take a look at your action.yaml because not a lot of folks are aware of that as well. Yeah, no, that's great. And nothing against Docker is just like, I have a hard time understanding, like working between the different environments. So that's, you know, that's why it's a little bit of a bear for me. Yeah. Yeah. And Daryl mentioned a really good point that not most devs are not great at Docker. I uh, said, we just, the goal is really <laughs> consistent environments. Uh, and the thing about that is that GitHub, what we're trying to do with this, um, uh, well, I already lost my link. Uh, but what we're trying to do with this is um, give you that consistent environment without you needing to leverage Docker if you're not really familiar with it. So um, that's awesome. Here, the similar to how when you run actions, you could have a run step that runs Bash. It's mm. so like when you're installing okay. that Cypress um, caching, or I'm not, I forgot what it was already. Uh, you can actually do that sort of setup here. Interesting. Yeah, so definitely that's worth awesome. a look. Um, and then also my blog post, I do go through details on how to migrate a Docker action into a composite run step action, which is essentially delete the Docker file, add it to the action at YAML. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, and then the Daryl uh, follow up on his question, GitHub Actions ran using Docker Actions 1.0. So that was the sort of the one way to do it. Uh, that changed when Actions 2.0 came out, which was, I don't know if we really, and with, in the world of GitHub Actions, I don't know if we actually spend a lot of time really focusing on version numbers, because um, we don't. Um, but I didn't what even I, realize that there was like a second version. Yeah, in 2019, in the fall of 2019, we uh, actually, not the fall, it was the spring. That's when we added CI as part of the, the functionality to Actions. So Actions did okay. not ship with CI originally in 2018. Uh, so when, 20, when 2019 versions of Actions came out, uh, we made it possible that you didn't have to use a Docker file as well when running Actions. That's awesome. Yeah, and again, they both work just as well. The one caveat okay. is like, depending on how much work you're doing in Docker and setup, it could take longer. Uh, you can actually <laughs> use a lot of built-in caching and stuff like that with GitHub's uh, runners by going the composite run step. So use yeah. it at your discretion. You'll definitely... <laughs> pull the levers, play with it and see if it works for you. Yeah. And when I was talking to Glub about that, like he made a good point, like I, and I didn't realize how much that GitHub actually ships with the environment. Like I know the AWS CLI is there by default. And like he was mentioning that there's browsers by default. So like, that's a lot of like basic things that people can use when they're working with their sites. It's awesome. Yeah, it, it, the the feature, and I didn't mention, I was going to say, like, I mentioned it before, but I didn't mention this. But I, every time I talk about Actions, I mention this. The, the whole point of Actions is so that GitHub can give you some tools and then get out of the way. Um, so mm. with the Action hosted Action Runner environment, we're giving, you, we're giving you the minutes, we're giving you the environment, so that way you can take it and run with it. Uh, and if it doesn't work for you, you can always do a self-hosted version. Uh, you could pull out the Docker. You could do whatever you would like to do to make it work for you. So uh, yeah. I love having questions with open source maintainers and learning their issues and their problems and seeing if I have an answer for it. If I don't, I love talking to the PM team and saying, hey, this open source project could use XYZ. Would you like to put right. XYZ into the runner? <laughs> right. Yeah, and I think it's great because like because you can run node scripts or you know whatever scripts you want. Like, there's so many possibilities of what you can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good times, and uh, folks, uh, it seems like we're our chat's getting livelier, uh, livelier now. So if you have questions about GitHub Actions, Apple Tools, uh, if you have questions about Colby <laughs> and uh, how he's making that purple <laughs> white in the background, um, <laughs> definitely uh, chat's open for questions. <laughs> Uh, this is Open Source Friday, so if you just joined us, uh, GitHub, we host open source maintainers, action creators, contributors uh, to talk about their projects and give them a place to, you know, get those shiny stars. Uh, just kidding. Stars are great. <laughs> uh, but on that note, actually, uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add about the action? Uh, I did have a, a, another off-the-cuff off uh, random question, but I didn't want to 
interject it and get you off the the rails no i don't think anything in particular you know i think uh i'm i'm excited to kind of pour more time into building out features with it like i was talking about the static directory thing um so it's just you know be able to figure out ways because like ultimately github doesn't have the context of the application beyond what you give it right so yes. if i need to figure out ways to do that configure in a configurable way for people so um you know figuring that as i go along but it's it's a cool challenge and i'm having a lot of fun with it yeah and i would encourage anybody who also is doing um a lot of this action work building stuff for your company like colby's doing uh, i do encourage you to check out the github support community as well um mm. it might not be as clear but if you do want to talk about github actions just go into the ecosystem tab uh, and then we have lots of questions that are unanswered. We have a lot of questions that are answered. Uh, so if you're just sort of like trying to figure out, hey, Brian mentioned this thing. I forgot what it was called. I'm using Docker, but I don't want to ask those questions here. Um, our support team, our PM team, our engineering team, they're all in here answering questions for you. So um, I do encourage you to just definitely check that out. So moving on, I did want to ask you about one thing that honestly, I. I used to ask this to all the people who came on the Open Source Friday, uh, which is GitHub stars. Um, a lot of folks like they they have questions about GitHub stars, and uh, I'm doing a whole just I'm building a whole other project um, outside of GitHub where it it encourages you to um, contribute to open source. It's called Open Source, mm -hmm. and uh, it has uh, a new feature I've been building for the past couple of weeks on stream, where <laughs> based on your interactions with GitHub, it will remind, it will basically suggest contributions that you can make. That's that's the high level. That's really cool. Um, I haven't got that far yet, so it's really cool. But it's, <laughs> right now, it's just an idea uh, in a database. I just have a I have a database of some projects that I'm going to be doing some weird checking with. Um, and uh, the question uh, I don't know how to akadak uh, akadak get a package <laughs> replacement npm registry. The answer is no. npm registry exists. Get a packages exist because there are other use cases that are needed. Uh, for packages, especially in the enterprise world. Uh, if you want to host packages for your organization, uh, it's a little different approach. So think outside JavaScript uh, for pack GitHub packages. Um, man, it's like I'm doing my job this 24 seven all the time. Um, so I actually wanted to, uh, a lot of people don't know this, you can actually go into GitHub stars and I'm going to put your name, which I think I spelled it correctly. <laughs> And yeah, I can yeah. see the last stuff that you uh, you have starred. So, That's cool. which is uh, kind of closes up the conversation. I'd like to ask you questions about the stuff that you've been starring on GitHub. That's fun. Yeah. So anything yeah. anything here sort of jumps out at you? <laughs> so that top one was interesting to me. Um, the uh, so I I really like to use. Um, Man, I'm trying to. Re can you scroll down a little bit just so I can see what the the? Um... <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> How do you, who thinks of this? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, uh, but it was, yeah, so I'm a big fan of SCSS. And okay. part of the issue that this person was trying to solve was that, so if you're using something like TypeScript or uh, I think even like, you know, CSS and JS, like you don't get the same uh, type generation tools and stuff like you get uh, when you use SCSS. So this person came up with a solution where you kind of write inside of your SCSS, like JS doc, where you define those props and what it can do to change the styles and you get this auto generation. I thought it was a really cool idea because um, I haven't seen something like that yet. And you know, as an SCSS fan, something like that is valuable. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was neat. <laughs> Excellent. I, honestly, I'm stuck on this. Is that supposed to be Freddie Mercury? I'm like trying to. I think so. That's what, that's how I take it. Yeah. This is excellent. Uh, I'm gonna give this a star because, not that I need this, but I just think the the effort that they put into their um their readme uh, is worth a star. So everybody, uh, if Absolutely. you're interested in learning more about SC, SCSS or SAS, um, I love SAS. Yeah, I, I used to use it a lot back in the, when I first started in the web development program not program when i started using web development like seriously and actually building projects mm -hmm. that people used um sas was huge uh, and i used it pretty much in everywhere i i touch uh, and i've sort of fallen off the train mainly because i start a lot of new projects and it's just it's more work to try to get everything set up the way i want it to and they're like sas yeah. isn't as included in a lot more of these um frameworks and bullet points true so i've sort of fallen off the sas train um i use post css yeah. at this point now 
Okay. Yeah, I I created like my own. So I use Next.js a lot. So I created like my own starter where I have it already boost, all bootstrapped yeah. and stuff. But um, yeah, like I haven't ever hit the like I know there's definitely a lot of benefits with something like CSS and JS, but I don't think I've ever hit the limitations of SAS because like a lot of times I'm working with a small team or something where it it doesn't really hit those uh, um, you know limitations as much. Yeah, excellent. And it looks like you're uh, just looking at your other stuff. Oh, Final Space API. That seems Oh yeah, let's stick into that one. Have you heard have you heard of Final Space? I have not heard of Final Space. It's it's my favorite cartoon. Uh <laughs> Olin Rogers, it, it's an amazing. So it's like a it's like a epic space journey and I love it so much. But um this uh this person put together uh an API for it. You know, I'm sure you've seen like the Pokey API yeah. and like those kind of things, but Yeah, the like, Game of Thrones never, back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, so there was never a Final Space API and um now we have one, <laughs> and I Excellent. love it. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, is this like a is this on Cartoon Network? Where is it? Um, where is this? Um, so it's on TBS, but now I think they put the the first two seasons up on HBO Max. Um, so nice. it's yeah, and I think out, out other countries have it on Netflix. Um, but yeah, it's a TBS show. But it's it's so like if you're into like that kind of like animated. Uh, shows yeah. like it's a space adventure it's so great is it like off the wall like adventure time it's not that off the wall but it's definitely okay. like goofy and fun but it's like it also has like the serious note because it's like a real space journey that it's kind of going through for the seasons it's okay i definitely think if that sounds at all interesting i definitely think you should check it out <laughs> you know i'm always worth the uh because I, I love watching like stuff i can turn my brain off uh while i'm uh writing code uh so like i i I watched a couple of the Adventure Time movies. I used to watch Adventure Time back in college, um, and like real, like what was it, the real show? Um, anyway, I watched pretty much a lot of those uh, Adult Swim type stuff, and uh, yeah. that's like what I put on, like if I'm doing late night coding, and I, I just need to like turn off my brain, but also stay awake so I can finish mm -hmm. this problem. Uh, that's like usually my go-to. I'm the opposite. I every single morning I watch cartoons, but I have that kind of stuff in the background. Like I just watch Static Living the Shock Dream. And yeah, and now I just do. Now I'm doing Batman Beyond. I I love it. Wow, wow, yeah. You're living every every eight year old's dream. Uh, you're living <laughs> right, right, which is uh, pretty awesome. And you're streaming on Twitch, <laughs> there we which go. is every eight year old's dream. Uh, well, I don't know about eight year olds, but um, yeah, they're right, big in right. the YouTube. But yeah, Colby, uh, we're pretty close to time. Did you have anything that you wanted to um, shout out before we sort of like end the stream and then walk into uh, you know the rest of our day jobs? <laughs> Yeah, um, definitely check out Apple Tools. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of awesome things there. T check out my action. Let me know what you think about it. Um, ultimately, I want to make it as easy as po possible for people to just drop that into their projects. So I'd love to hear what people think. Um, but yeah, uh, check out my other stuff. I'm on. I'm at Colby Fayak everywhere. Uh, Twitter, YouTube, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so and GitHub. Nice, nice for the consistency. Uh, apologize for B Dougie who's on uh, on Twitter who always gets my mentions. <laughs> Yeah, you got to be consistent throughout everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's easy for me because you know who else is Colby Fayok? Yeah, no, they're only one, <laughs> one and only. Uh, and then before I sign off, I just wanted to shout out and say that we are doing this every Friday. Daryl, thanks for showing up. Uh, thanks for showing up and helping us with the um, <laughs> with. Uh, we actually been doing a stream uh, with my colleague who's in Australia. We're building this integration which I wanted to have today, uh, but it's called Git Twitch. Whenever you start a repo. It, uh, it basically has an animation on the screen. Uh, we will start doing some interaction chat interactions uh, for the That's GitHub really Twitch. Cool. And uh, I would just want to point out our next stream, if you, the question is how often do you stream? Fridays. And um, our next week we'll be talking with uh, Gina, actually, who's the maintainer of Octoprint. <laughs> uh, there's a awesome. lot of Octos, but Octoprint. Uh, which is a web interface for your 3D printer. So uh, that's next week. And then the week after, we're talking to um, Ify, talking about ProseMirror, uh, actually ReMirror, which is a CMS, like a, basically the CMS that you see in GitHub, where you can actually, anyway, he's basically re rebuilding the GitHub uh, CMS for like your markdown as a reusable component everywhere in React. Um, so uh, that's a great conversation. Uh, I'm actually implementing it in my open source project, um, sort of, it's kind of broken, uh, but I'm looking forward to that conversation. So uh, we do have a meetup page, it's a good GitHub virtual meetup if you did want to get notifications. Uh, for the, at the moment, meetup is working for us. Um, so that's why we, uh, <laughs> that's we, why we do that. Uh, but yeah. That's awesome. 
So Colby, thanks again. And everybody else in the chat. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, stay saucy.